Good morning, Controls Champions. It's a beautiful day here in the Bahamas, and today I'm gonna to be showing you how to program one of these without one of these. So often we have to program these things while they're connected to the machine, and sometimes those darn people in production just wanna keep this away from us, and we can still do our job without it. Join me in the Bahamas, let's get to it. Let's talk a little bit about what we're trying to do. I have a penny and a quarter, and this is going to be a very simple presence absence application. I wanna know, is there a penny in view? And I wanna make sure that it's a penny and not a quarter. So first, is there anything on the view? Second, is it a penny and not a quarter? We've already got this basically set up. It's got good contrast for a penny. The quarter obviously isn't great contrast. I'm not gonna worry about that right now because I'm not trying to detect that. That should look very different than the penny. So this ends up working well. So first question is, how do we record? Well, we go to this button here, record playback options, and we make sure we're saving it to the right place. This is also available under image. There's a record playback options as well. So there's a record tab and a playback tab. Where are we recording to? Well, here we can have a folder and I've already recorded some images here. I'm gonna just go delete the images out of that folder so this will come back to zero. So there are already some images there just because I was using this for a, a test run before I did the recording. I'm just gonna clear the record folder. Clear everything, delete, yeah, good. Okay, so it's empty now. I've got a way that I generally like to approach this, and I like to have a pass folder and a fail folder. And you can also have it keep track of this in, in some ways, uh, re record pass images to good folder and bad images to bad folder. Um, but I want to specify right now, I know that these images are good, I know that these images are bad, and then when we go offline, we can run through those images and make sure that our application works properly for those. So I'm just gonna tell it do not sort right now. I'm already telling it to go to a pass folder and we'll record some images that I think should be good. The rest of this is just about naming convention. And this is gonna say all the pictures are gonna be called image with a number one, two, three, four, five, and they're gonna be bitmap file. That's great. There's also an option for a JPEG file and you might be tempted to do that because there's smaller files which is more efficient, but the problem with that is when they compress to a JPEG, you always have to worry to change the image a little bit. And that's how JPEG works. It did change the image a little bit. Is it important? Is it significant? Uh, you know, that's for the philosophers to discuss, um, but I always just feel happier knowing that it didn't change. Bitmaps are exactly right. So I'm gonna click okay. And I'm gonna make sure and I've only got one thing in the view that I actually want, cool. And I'm gonna click on record. Now, this isn't actually recording anything until we trigger. So I can trigger by clicking on this button again. Notice it says it recorded something for us, called it image 0000. And the next one that I record, I'll just click trigger again, image 0001. Okay, good, so we're recording, it's labeling them right. And uh, there is another, I, I think, convenient way to trigger. If we look at image here, it says trigger, the hotkey for it is F5. So if we're not exactly in this screen where there's a trigger button available to us, we can also be just hitting F5 on our keyboard. So I'm gonna move this penny around a little bit. And just take a few more pictures of it. Okay, in my book, those should all be passing. You know, the penny's in different locations, but there is a penny and it's not anything else. It is a penny. I'm gonna add one more that's rotated a little bit and that'll come into play here in a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna stop recording and now I wanna make some bad images, things that should fail. So I'm gonna come back to record. Now we're gonna record into a fail or we could say good and bad or whatever. Nomenclature isn't that important. And it's letting us know right here that it's gonna create this folder because it doesn't exist yet. So, okay, sounds good. 
I'm gonna trigger once. So if there's nothing there, that should definitely be a fail. I'm gonna turn on record and I'll trigger again. Look, we recorded something in the fail folder, image 0000, okay? So it starts counting over again when it's in a new folder. And then if there's a quarter in the field of view, those are also fails. Okay, that ought to be enough to work with. So I'm gonna stop recording. And now I'm going to disconnect from the sensor and I'll be able to set up a project with that. So first I got to start emulating now. Now I mentioned this in a previous video, but just to recap, if we come back up to system options under emulation here. You'll have to register this number and your company name with Cognex on their website so that you can get this number. This is what enables offline programming or emulation. So the computer can actually pretend to be a camera. It'll take those pictures that we used and it'll run a real camera program that we can create and modify. And then we can take that program and save it back onto a real camera. New machines are, are always uh, going up and down. Everybody's working on them. But if you can get some good images, you can work and be out of everybody's way and be able to be efficient while other people are working in the area. You can also test changes to something that's running live and working and just, you know, try to tweak it to make it better in some way before putting the program back out there. Minimal disruption of production equipment. One more thing that I want to point out here, if you know what camera you're going to be using, you can select it right here. And obviously there's a whole bunch of options because Cognix makes a bunch of cameras. I know that we've got a 7802 and it's not a color. It's just a black and white monochrome. So I'm going to click on that. This in the background just crosses all the T's and dots all the I's. It makes sure that we're emulating at the right speed for that camera. So when we're looking at how fast things run, it gives us a better idea. And it makes sure all the settings are right in job files, resolution, etc. So I'm going to click OK. Yep, that's fine. And now it's going to ask us to save a new job file somewhere. I don't really care where I name it or what I call it. I'm just going to call it uh, emulation because that's what we're doing right now. Save that. Cool. And let it catch up here. Okay, it looks like our software caught up with us now. And the way we would emulate is I'm just going to double click on my laptop here because my laptop is where I'm emulating. It even says down here, local emulator. And you'll notice the camera is still connected to the computer. It could be, it doesn't have to be. Um, the whole idea is that you can unplug and walk away. For the sake of just showing you that this can work without being plugged into the camera, I'm gonna unplug it now. Okay, we're unplugged. I'm gonna click on refresh just to prove that it's not in the tree anymore. So no camera there, we really can't emulate this. So we want to set up a playback folder now. And I'm going to click on this button again. Playback is set for some whatever thing it's set for. It looks like we lost our link there as well. Going to. That's the folder that we were saving things to. Again, we've got pass and fail. Let's start with pass. Let's make sure we can find all the good images. Click on OK. Now that I've set that up, we're in playback mode and I can step through those images that we took. And these are only the past images, so it'll just loop through and we can see the same ones over and over again. No quarters or blanks. Okay, so the focus here isn't really going to be on the program itself. I'm just going to do a really easy uh, PatMax tool just to find that, just to find that uh, penny. And uh, let's use a circular model. Okay, so that's going to be the pattern that we're training, and our search window is right now the whole screen. Maybe we don't want it to be the whole screen. Maybe we only want to find things that are near the center. I don't know. We could have an application like that. I'll click OK just to have something. Notice it automatically taught this pattern. It recognized that green line as the border of the penny that we're seeing. I'm also noticing that because we have 
ambient lighting that we're using, there's a little bit of a shadow cast. The light is coming from this direction, casting a little bit of a shadow on that side. So I'm gonna point that out because it's not ideal. It's probably not something we would want in the real world, but again, I think it's fine for here. Okay, so now that we've got that set up, let's just step through the pictures and see if we pass. Now, that was the one we trained on. It passed on the second one, did not pass on that one. Why is that the case? What's different? Looks like it's rotated the same, it's just in a different spot on the window. So now we gotta actually look at the tool. I'm gonna give this tool a, uh, a name. Let's call it Penny, because that's what we're looking for. And we didn't find anything, so nothing's showing up here. Let's look at settings. First thing I'm gonna guess is maybe the, the acceptable threshold isn't quite what we want. What if I reduce the acceptable threshold for this pattern? Maybe you'll find something. Hmm, it's not working at all. What about a scale tolerance? Find something just a little bit bigger. What about a rotational tolerance? I really don't mind if this rotates all the way around. Looks like that was the key right now. So I can bring this back to 50 probably. Yep, looks like it. And the scale tolerance even. Because I do want this to be as specific as it can be. I don't know why it thinks that rotated because if I look back at, well, okay, it's rotated from that guy. This is the one we actually trained on. I think this is just because the lighting is inconsistent. It's really not rotated, but that's fine. So we found, you know, this is the point we're just going through some images and trying to get past this wherever we can. And maybe we find something like this and say, oh, there was, there can be parts in that area. I actually want to change this region here and make sure I'm searching for it in the right place. By the way, this search region is often called an ROI or a region of interest. And it's just where we're looking for that pattern that we taught. Okay, so let's make sure we click through all of them. Looks like it passes everywhere. Great. So what if we go and look at the fail images? I wanna make sure that they come back red. Okay, so there's the first one, it's blank. There's no penny or quarter. Everything turns red, good, we got a fail. What if there's a quarter? Oh boy, found something. It thinks it found a penny right there. And it didn't find a penny, there's no penny, right? So we need to adjust something. Maybe this acceptable threshold needs to be lowered. I'll just keep walking. By the way, if we come down here, we can see the score that that came back with was 62. So I'm sorry, I'm not lowering the threshold, I'm, I'm increasing it. I wanna see something that matches better than what it's matching right now. It's obviously gotta be higher than 62 for that to fail. Okay, so we fail now, that's really right on the edge. What if I just bring it up a little past that to make sure? I'm gonna step through the other intentional fail images. Okay, everything fails. Now we're gonna come back to the pass. I'm gonna make sure all of these still pass. So if I click through this, looks like everything still passes. Another thing that I wanna look at with the intent of being, uh, of setting this acceptable threshold appropriately, this score here is 98.9. What if I click through to other things? 98.6, 98.9, 99, 98.9. These are all very high numbers. So this pattern ends up recognizing the penny very well in all of the examples that I've given that should be a pass. So maybe having an acceptable threshold of 70 is lower than we need. The quarter picture that we had that matched this the best got a pass of uh, 62 was the, was the uh, match score. So maybe we want somewhere in between those two, between 62 and 99, let's say it's around 80 or so. We could go a lot higher than this and then we would rule out more defect or you know wrong parts. We would rule them out better. Another thing to think about is how do you want this system to fail? Because it, it may not be perfect every time. What if there's a penny that comes through that has a piece cut out of it? Or what if there's a, 
instead of quarters, what if we had something that looked kind of like a penny that was closer in size, uh, a nickel or a dime? We're going to want to make sure that it, either, either we say parts are precious, we never want to throw out a good part, or we say parts are cheap and one bad part getting through is expensive. So maybe we would rather point this towards uh, failing good parts than passing bad parts. So in that case, maybe we say 95 here and that would still pass for all of the images that we have. So that's again, where you gotta get the runtime in and see what it's like statistically on a large batch of parts. So I'm just gonna leave it at 80 for now, somewhere in the middle should be good. Come back and test all of these. They all pass, good, and the fails. Yep, they all fail. We got it. it's coming back red here, it's coming back red here, it's coming back red here, all the different places we can see that it did not find a penny. So a couple closing thoughts here, just before I wrap up, I want to point out, I've been looking down here for the match score for this tool. You can also see whether things pass or fail and their score up here. So, you know, it's always nice to know the different places to look. Also, the reason I keep talking about, you know, having this small or making it just a little bit bigger instead of having it the whole screen is because the bigger this area is, the more places we're searching for that pattern, the longer it takes to process. And it really doesn't take that long to process anyway. If we uh, look here, it tells us it took 8.7 milliseconds to execute this. If we went super big, it would probably take longer. Look, it's going, you know, 13 and a half or 26 and a half. So it does make a difference and that can be valuable. Obviously we're not always strapped for time. Sometimes we also just want to rule out areas like this where the lighting is strange or where other confusing things might be that we know our part will never be in. So things to think about. And the last thought is if you can't get something to work offline like this with your good pictures and your bad pictures or your pass and fail or this object and that object, you may have to go back and change the hardware. And so that's obviously something that you can't do in your offline mode. Try really hard to make sure that those pictures that you get are good. They've got the right focus, the right lighting, the right aperture and exposure, because that's not something you can change offline. It's, you know, you might just be wasting your time if you try and get something to work on those pictures and you come back to the camera and say, you know, I really have to change exposure a little bit to get the right picture. Be mindful of that and try not to repeat work if you can help it. So that's all we got for this episode. I hope you liked it. Please uh, share, comment, like and subscribe. I'd love to see you coming back and joining in the conversation. See you next time.